back here uh, interacting with you in our monthly uh, call. Uh, if you recall, uh, you know, a month ago, uh, we had broadly given our outlook in terms of the markets and we had indicated that there were two key events which will decide the future course of the fixed income markets. Uh, as we speak today, uh, two significant events have already, you know, taken place. The first one was obviously the union budget for 2020-21. Uh, in this, as against market expectation of maybe a higher degree of fiscal slippage, possibly a higher number in terms of the sovereign uh, you know, security borrowing, the outcome was actually quite positive. So on the fiscal deficit, both for uh, the current year as well as for the next financial year, the numbers are more or less in line with the markets. There was no excessive slippage as far as the fiscal deficit numbers were concerned. Secondly, in terms of the borrowing for both the current financial year, which is going to end on 31st March, and the revised numbers given for the borrowing for the next financial year were in line with the market expectation. In fact, the borrowing numbers for the current financial year were actually less than what the markets were anticipating. So this was actually a, a positive as far as the fixed income markets outlook was concerned. You did see the bonds rally a little bit. Uh, clearly, there was a bit of an impetus given to the broader economy in terms of a fiscal stimulus since the fiscal deficit did you know, expand. However, from our perspective, I think there was no significant growth stimulus really provided. So on that front, at least, uh, you know, unlike the market expectation earlier that the budget would be uh, somewhat of a, you know, a, a provider of a very big bank stimulus to the broader economy, the actual outcome was somewhat muted. Uh, you know, while we may uh, sort of uh, deliberate over the numbers and possibly the revenue estimates. I think from our perspective, broadly the revenue estimates have been uh, somewhat uh, uh, moderate. If you really look at uh, in terms of the broader uh, uh, nominal GDP expectations of 10 percent, the revenue growth estimates have been somewhat in line with the nominal uh, GDP growth, which somewhat seems to be fair. However, a greater reliance on the non-tax revenues where there was an ex where there built in an expectation or estimates of uh, you know one off uh, through uh, divestments as well as asset sales. I think that number is going to be possibly evaluated as we go you know, into the third quarter of the next financial year. So at least till the 3Q or 4Q of FI21, uh, the markets will some is more or less believe in uh, the current trajectory as far as fiscal deficit numbers are concerned and may not see any undue concern. So I think that's broadly uh, of a quick uh, recap of the union budget. The second event, which was actually a much more important driver of both the uh, market movement in the near term as well as in terms of uh, creating expectations going forward, even for UTI asset management firm, has been clearly the sixth uh, bi monthly uh, RBI monetary policy review. So, this uh, policy was more or less supposed to be somewhat neutral because uh, the markets were not expecting any, any rate action from RBI. Uh, that more or less did uh, you know take place the rbi did not cut its monetary policy uh, you know benchmark rate uh, at the same time there was also an expectation that the commutative monetary policy stance would also not undergo any change that was also more or less in line with you know market as well as our expectations however there was significant uh, you know uh, focus on uh, developmental and regulatory changes which uh, did in fact uh, enthuse the market you know, a lot. In fact, uh, you could almost say that there was a de facto easing through some of these developmental and regulatory changes, which in a way not only infused additional liquidity in the system, but also did uh, in some ways try and push transmission of the recent rate cuts as well as you know, push the lending community to start or restart you know, the uh, sort of the credit growth, which has been somewhat weak uh, on a current financial year to date basis and obviously is not a good precursor if you really are looking at a meaningful economic growth going forward. So I think on that front, the three measures which largely revolved around, you know, giving certain incentives to the banking sector to restart, uh, you know, uh, additional borrowings for select sectors through some dispensation in terms of lowering the cost of funding as well as provi providing them, uh, you know, slightly longer term, uh, uh, you know, uh, funds at a fixed rate, which was far lower than, uh, you know, what they would typically be borrowing in the deposit markets. And finally, also giving them a forbearance not to make provisions for, you know, certain projects and certain uh, borrowers, class of borrowers 
who essentially were facing uh, you know near term uh, issues and given certain space and you know given certain uh, sort of time to some of these sectors as well as these uh, you know industry segments you could actually you know kick start the stalled projects or you know the stalled sort of level of economic activity so i think broadly these were uh, uh, significantly positive for not only the economy as well as for our fixed income markets so you did see a meaningful rally as far as uh, you know the gsec uh, yields were concerned we also saw a specific uh, sort of you know intervention from rbi during you know both of january as well as Feb uh, month of february where uh, they did you know a combination of uh, operation twist which involved buying long term bonds and selling short but net net there was you know net addition of uh, liquidity in the system as well as uh, you know focus more at the short end through uh, you know this ltro mechanism to bring uh, the yield levels down so we actually saw not only the yield curve flatten a bit or but a you know a parallel sort of a shift downwards so the short end segment the 2 to 5 year segment uh, you know the, of the risk sort of risk free curve did rally a bit so did the 10 year yields uh, since sort of pre policy to post policy we have seen the 10 year yield move down by almost close to you know 23 odd basis point so this clearly is you know going to also going forward drive down the corporate bond yield curve and which we did see over the you know the last uh, 10 odd days so the cost of borrowing for uh, you know a lot of triple a rated securities or issuers has come down meaningfully as also for some of the double a rated issuers who you know in the previous month were possibly not getting uh, you know the same level of uh, liquidity so i think this combination has been broadly very positive for our markets uh, going forward given the fact that uh, rbi has uh, uh, very clearly stated that uh, they do see uh, you know uh, certain space available for more policy accommodation and also if you really look at the inflation forecast as projected by rbi it does indicate a uh, inverted v uh, so the headline cpi which currently we are seeing at very elevated levels are likely to decline by sometime around september october of this calendar year which effectively will also mean that if the inflation trajectory does follow that path then it does open up a window for rbi to actually follow through with the rate cut while in if you really look at it the rate cut may not be as meaningful going forward because an incremental 25 basis point rate cut is not going to really move the needle but the measures undertaken in this policy towards infusing excessive liquidity in the system and also you know giving certain incentives for uh, the banking sector to uh, increase their credit uh, growth i think are in my view a bigger driver of you know the optimism that we see in the markets so i think in that backdrop since uh, you know uh, we have a fairly large number of enabling factors for a very soft interest rate regime going forward we think uh, you know you can see uh, not only the risk free rate but also the broad borrowing cost for a large part of the corporate sector also come down we've already seen the first stage you know take place uh, unless uh, you actually start seeing inflation uh, not moving as per expected lines or growth actually accelerating at a pace faster than what has been currently forecast we see uh, a very uh, positive bias as far as interest rate outlook is concerned so if you look at it uh, the term premium spreads which pre policy levels were almost close to 148 basis point have come down to a more longer term averages of about 120 basis point we think going forward this can compress a little bit more because the low growth environment in our view will prevail over rest of you know uh, the coming financial year as well uh, this is driven both by soft global growth outlook as well as uh, you know some positive drivers for indian inflation trajectory which is bad, largely revolving around oil remaining soft uh, you know low domestic growth not uh, allowing any price level pressures and finally uh, you know we have seen initial rounds of deceleration as far as food prices are concerned which were the drivers of you know uh, sort of increasing uh, headline inflation that has also started declining a little bit going forward we feel that momentum can sustain if we see another year of normal monsoons so that i think will be something to watch out for as we go you know into middle of this calendar year so with this backdrop with a softer interest rate outlook with more or less uh, you know a positive uh, opinion as far as rbi's own stance is concerned going forward uh, you know we've added duration across all our funds so we were 
sort of neutral on duration uh, pre budget pre RBI policy we have actually turned uh, somewhat overweight and I think that is the position we will hold as of now. Uh, we will clearly watch out for uh, any uh, unusual uh, you know spike in prices of either key commodities or food and at the same time we will also look at uh, you know uh, sort of uh, pass through of the initiatives undertaken so far by RBI to ensure that you know liquidity continues to remain ample in the system and you actually do see uh, some degree of transmission as far as rates are concerned. So, I think that is something to watch out for uh, you will uh, look at uh, you know broadly these three or four key aspects. So, clearly headline inflation trajectory needs to start slowing down and needs to actually more or less follow the glide path indicated. Two, oil should uh, more or less remain in the current band, uh, it should not move up above $55 to a barrel on a sustained basis that is very important. Third, uh, a, a normal or a near normal monsoon I think while we are not looking at uh, you know any uh, sort of uh, an extreme outcome as far as monsoon is concerned. But uh, given the fact that last year we actually had excessive rainfall which did disrupt you know uh, both agricultural activity and did lead to a, a near term spike. So, that is again something very critical to watch out for. Broadly uh, on the global front like I said earlier you know growth remains soft most of this developed market central banks have continued to remain accommodative as far as their policy stance is concerned which is which is positive it does not put any undue pressure on domestic uh, monetary policy at the same time it does not put any undue pressure on the currency. So, I think on that uh, sort of a backdrop uh, you know I will uh, sort of end my quick comments on the on uh, the fixed income markets outlook and uh, maybe now we can take some questions you know from uh, uh, from the members and uh, you know our uh, 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 sort of partners who have logged in. So, I have received uh, initial uh, questions. Uh, the first one actually relates to do we expect any scope for further rate cuts with the yields already dropping by 15 to 25 basis point and where do you think one should allocate their fresh allocation in fixed income funds. So, like I mentioned earlier given uh, a much more positive outlook as far as the rate environment is concerned you are right uh, while uh, rates have dropped between 15 to 20 basis point from a pre to post policy levels. Like I mentioned earlier you know we would not be surprised that the current trend as far as easing is concerned actually continues provided the four factors that I mentioned earlier also play out in favor of uh, you know uh, this outlook. So, uh, if uh, you know markets do start penciling in continued uh, uh, accommodative stance from RBI with inflation uh, may be crossing or dropping below 5 percent like I mentioned earlier you can see one more rate cut which could propel a bit more of a rally in the 10 year yields. So, I would not be surprised that you could actually see the 10 year yield crossing or sort of uh, you know reaching the lows of 6 quarter odd level. So, the broad band that we have already given in our communication has been between 620 to 660 we think that band still holds as of now. Uh, we will possibly revise it if we think there are any incremental data flow which sort of uh, you know uh, makes us uh, review that position. In terms of funds uh, clearly funds who are uh, in a position to benefit from a rally in the yields you know uh, sort of beyond having a pure accrual bias will benefit. So, on that perspective I think some of the short term income to corporate bond categories that we have been suggesting for most of you know this uh, year are products which we think still can uh, benefit investors. So, from UTI is a stable of products I would continue to recommend UTI corporate bond fund, UTI money market fund for investors who have very short term investment horizon as, as, as well as UTI floater fund where uh, you know uh, we have actually sort of dynamically managed the portfolio to take benefit of both you know rising as well as declining interest rates. So, that is my recommendation at the long end uh, UTI guild fund continues to be a, a very good performer in its pair set. I think that is a fund which you have always suggested you can use it uh, you know episodically to time your entry and exit if you actually have a trading sort of a bent uh, in terms of your investment strategy. Otherwise, uh, we strongly recommend continuing with a systematic investment strategy as far as the UTI guild fund is concerned. Uh, another question that we received is around the significant stress in the telecom sector and uh, you know 
again uh, related to our segregation of the Vodafone idea exposure in our funds. So, you are right, I think we have been highlighting this earlier as well, uh, the stress the telecom sector has actually been very unfortunate. And uh, you know, while we had highlighted earlier when the first downgrade of Vodafone idea took place, that uh, given the initiatives undertaken by both the DOT, uh, you know, Ministry of Telecom as well as the Government of India, uh, you know, with some very public statements made by different arms of the Government of India, our view was that an amicable resolution could be found without really pushing uh, you know, some of these entities into uh, a very highly stressed or a delinquent kind of a scenario, particularly because the economy does need you know, uh, sort of a, a strong telecom sector to continue to grow. The telecom uh, revolution in India was actually one of the key drivers of uh, higher economic growth as far as India is concerned. And that I think is something which we will need as a backbone if we wish to continue to be a more uh, you know uh, sort of a IT enabled or you know a more modern uh, economy going forward. So, I think in that backdrop uh, given the statements made from DOT the sort of the forbearance that they had given as well as the statements made by Ministry of Finance and Ministry of Telecom did make us believe that an amicable resolution would be found. So, we were not willing to sort of react to just the near term rating downgrade. Unfortunately, uh, the courts have not been very supportive uh, in this whole uh, scenario. We have actually seen uh, both the, uh, the repeal, uh, uh, the review appeal filed by the telcos as well as the subsequent uh, appeal for amendment of you know, the payment terms filed by the telcos both being dismissed by the Supreme Court. And that clearly did present uh, a very uh, sort of a difficult situation for you know particularly one uh, telecom operator who had the largest liability which was word of an idea. Now, they have been able to you know pay some amount of the AGR dues uh, unlike uh, the other telecom operator which is Airtel which has been able to actually uh, pay a much higher amount. But given the large uh, uh, liability which exists as far as you know the initial calculated numbers of AGR dues are concerned, it will be very difficult for word of an idea to really you know uh, sort of mobilize that size of funds and make that payment in such a short time span. So, I think that is the backdrop in which the rating agencies as well as our uh, you know credit view did uh, sort of uh, uh, downgrade this exposure. And given the current segregation regulations of SEBI, you know any subsequent downgrade to do below investment grade, especially when it is done by multiple rating agencies, particularly the rating agencies uh, you know who had rated the bond exposure that we had. We actually had to take uh, a view on you know what to do with our exposure. We chose to segregate it. As things stand today, if you have been following uh, uh, again uh, the media releases as well as uh, the news reports, there are still plans afoot as to try and ensure uh, you know some sort of a resolution still does take place. So I think that's very important uh, to watch out for. Uh, uh, you know if a resolution does take place which allows certain dispensation and the only dispensation which I think the telecom companies are asking for is to be given a, a some sort of a breather as well as a longer maturity you know payment sort of terms. I think that will be a big positive for the telecom sector. So, the companies have moved away from disputing AGR dues to now acknowledging the AGR dues, but asking for some time to you know pay these dues. I think that is that itself should you know allow at least some uh, bit of uh, I would say convergence as far as both the litigator and the litigants are concerned. So, I think uh, on that front uh, let us wait and watch in our view uh, you know uh, between now and 17th March when the next hearing of the Supreme Court takes place. Uh, if any uh, positive announcement does come through that will clearly be uh, not only a big positive for the sort of the credit outlook for these firms, but it will also be very positive at a broader level for the telecom sector and you know for the economy as well. We have some other questions related to some of the stressed exposures or you know companies who have defaulted or been downgraded in our portfolio. Uh, another question is around DHFL as well as uh, you know Jorbat Shillong. Uh, you know I must mention that you know unlike 2019 where a lot of these uh, sort of stress cases were uh, undergoing various forms of uh, resolution and none of them actually did fructify or none of them actually did move in a very meaningful manner. 
uh, in the current calendar year 2020 you know we are uh, a lot more optimistic on you know eventual resolution of some of these cases in the case of dhfl as you're aware uh, you know both the ibc act was amended to include uh, financial entities at the same time uh, rba was also given additional powers to uh, you know sort of uh, uh, decide on which entity could actually be taken into the ibc and in the case of dhfl this was the step undertaken so dhfl right now is undergoing an ibc driven uh, resolution process uh, the coc has already been formed they've already had a couple of meetings and they've also invited expression of interest from uh, in, you know entities who are interested in uh, seeking uh, some uh, participation in either taking ownership of the enterprise as a whole or some of the other business segments of that uh, you know company so as we understand uh, it is clearly moving uh, much faster and in a much more positive direction than what it had through most of 2019 uh, we do expect a much earlier resolution this time round uh, that's primarily because the interest of all the entities, whether they are mutual funds, insurance companies or banks have been addressed through the composition of a much more broad based committee of creditors. And secondly, uh, the pace at which you know, uh, the resolution is being now uh, pursued in our view should ensure that you actually do see a you know, meaningful outcome over the next one or two quarters. So the expression of interest have been indicated and this has been reported in the press as well. I think uh, we would choose to believe that there are significant number of uh, interested parties in taking uh, you know uh, some sort of uh, equity stake or ownership of some of these assets uh, as far as uh, the timelines are concerned i think on that possibly a much more clarity will emerge when uh, the next round of uh, meeting of the coc takes place so we will keep you updated through our uh, fund pulse as well as you know our monthly call in the case of Jorabat Shillong, again, uh, uh, that has also now started moving in a much positive direction. As you're aware, uh, uh, you know, in the uh, AGM of LNFS, uh, the chairman, uh, Mr. Uday Kota, had very clearly mentioned that they are very optimistic on a group level resolution for both LNFS and its subsidiaries uh, by middle of this year. Our exposure in uh, Jorabat Shillong Expressway Limited is actually been more constrained by you know a court ruling rather than by its ability to fund or pay off its uh, uh, bond holders or debt i think as things stand today like we've already mentioned uh, in the earlier call uh, there was a expression of interest from bidders for this asset uh, there were two interested parties who were keen on buying out this asset and the new uh, sort of uh, payment waterfall mechanism that lnfs board has recommended now will ensure that the senior secured creditors will be paid out to the full uh, because uh, the current uh, mechanism ensures that as long as the liquidation value right which is if you were to just you know sort of uh, liquidate all the assets of the underlying firm is higher than that of the senior secured creditors you know they will first receive the sort of the payments from those uh, uh, you know sort of eventual resolution so on that again uh, hopefully we will see a much faster pace as things go forward unfortunately uh, this is also still under the jurisdiction of the nclat so we will have to wait till uh, there is a uh, sort of a eventual uh, uh, you know pronouncement or a judgment delivered so the good part is it's clearly moving in uh, in a positive direction and more or less in line with what we've been stating that we will recover our principal in full Uh, there's also a question related to uh, you know uh, what should one allocate money to going forward i think uh, we broadly address that uh, you know if you do have an investment horizon of anything between uh, you know one week to one month do look at uh, uti liquid cash plan which has had a very good track record of both performance uh, and has handled uh, all the you know upheavals in the markets if you have an investment horizon of anything between uh, one month to you know maybe even 12 months Look at the UTI money market fund. It is a fund which straddles both the you know ultra short term as well as the lower duration category. If you have investment horizon of anything between uh, you know nine to eighteen months, then look at the UTI floater fund, which again has uh, sort of demonstrated its performance track record, and also uh, you know again straddles the low duration category. If you have an investment horizon of anything beyond uh, 
you know uh, 18 months to up to 3 years and so on then I think the best product to that uh, we would recommend is the corporate bond fund. For uh, investors who typically look at liquid fund you always had the option of being in the arbitrage fund that is another fund which has again a very good track record and I would recommend that uh, you look at this fund as well. Uh, so I guess uh, these were the questions that we received so far. Uh, if there are any further questions, uh, you know, uh, we can take them offline. Maybe you know you could send it across as usual through the email, and we'll be very happy to address those. Uh, once again, thank you for being on this call, and very happy to uh, you know continue this going forward. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us here today, uh, uh, you know, through the Facebook live channel as well as on YouTube. Uh, and I think some of you are also logged in on telephone. Uh, so thanks for being here today. Um, I think Aman's already given you a rundown on the debt market and some of his views. So what I'll be doing over the next 15-20 uh, minutes is taking you through our thoughts overall on equity markets, what's happening in the economy, what's happening in the markets. Uh, we've already started to receive some questions from you all uh, and if there are more please feel free to send them across. By the time I get to the end I can take some of those as well. Uh, and after that I'll hand over to Amit Prem Chandani uh, who co-manages the value opportunities fund along with me uh, and he'll talk uh, on that fund. Uh, we are obviously doing this uh, particular call uh, in the context of February, a few weeks after the budget. Uh, the budget has typically been the topic of much discussion uh, with everybody sort of looking at that for direction. Uh, but really in my opinion the budget has proved to be not so material for many years now. It was maybe 15-20 years ago where the fortunes of industries and companies were affected overnight by a stroke of a pen or a change of a policy in the budget. Uh, that is no longer the case and there's a lot more continuity uh, to what the government has been doing in terms of policy. Uh, and also keep in mind that many of the big reforms that we talk about in the economy, many of the big changes which have actually happened in recent years have all actually happened outside the scope of the budget, be it things like uh, you know direct benefits transfer, uh, whether you are talking about uh, you know the opening up of Jandan bank accounts, uh, whether you are talking about the IBC, whether you are talking about RERA. So all these have really nothing to do with the budget and this is what is laying down sort of the uh, uh, legal infrastructure and the structural reforms that India needs for a much bigger growth trajectory and I think therefore to that extent the budget has really lost its relevance in recent times. Uh, also keep in mind that indirect taxes have now moved to the purview of the GST council so it's no longer part of the budget and the government does retain the flexibility to act outside the scope of the budget like we saw in the month of September they announced a big cut in corporate tax rates. Uh, traditionally this could have been part of the budget but you know they chose a different time to make that announcement and therefore once again it leads you to that conclusion that you know the budget itself is not really a make or break event for India and should not be seen as such. Uh, uh, going ahead. Uh, I think you know when we began this year looking more at a global context uh, the focus was more on the India US uh, or rather the US China trade war uh, and what could be the outcome there and at the start of the year there was a lot more optimism uh, that with its limited trade agreement being reached between those two nations uh, the outlook for growth was going to be far better in 2020 with the tensions of 2019 becoming a thing of the past. Um, unfortunately as we went Went through January, uh, this whole issue of the coronavirus has come into the sort of uh, forefront and the limelight. Uh, and 
at this point of time clearly uh, once again this has raised the potential downside risk to global growth. Uh, supply chains for most companies whether it is multinationals or even for so many of the Indian companies that we talk to do pass through China and at this point of time I think what most companies in India are telling us is that they have between you know 60 to 90 days of inventory where they can manage but anything which causes this disruption to continue beyond that would certainly have an impact on the uh, uh, supply chain and therefore the would be some negative impact on growth as well. Uh, equity markets except for the you know severely affected China have largely ignored this impact at this point of time which is why you are seeing markets across the world led by the US you know still at all time highs but the bond markets and commodity markets have clearly uh, you know started to reflect some amount of those growth related concerns into the way those markets are behaving and therefore there is a bit of dichotomy between these two. Uh, if the coronavirus led disruptions were to persist beyond a quarter then I think you know the equity markets would start to get a little bit more nervous but fingers crossed at this point you know hopefully uh, you know they are the authorities are managing to get this under control both in China and elsewhere around the world. Um, coming back to uh, India uh, we have got a GDP number which will come up uh, I think uh, next week so that will again give us a peak but we do not expect a very significant improvement at this point of time I think it will take the September quarter before we really start to see some sort of an uptick but I think clearly the deceleration in growth momentum is behind us and we can see some gradual healing process uh, take place going forward. Um, credit markets still functioning with a little bit of a trust deficit uh, but the RBI has continued to maintain its monetary policy in accommodative mode and some of the steps that they have taken to try and inject liquidity and try to incentivize lenders will hopefully have some of a bit of a positive impact and remember the government has also taken several steps over the last few months with some kind of a lag we would expect that these decisions as well would have a little bit of a positive impact on uh, growth and therefore improve the situation. Um, coming back to markets and the way markets have behaved uh, in a global context India is not among the best performing markets on a one year basis uh, or even on a three or six month basis. Uh, we have been lagging perhaps reflecting the fact that there have been growth challenges the credit crisis has raised issues with a lot of investors. Uh, but if you look within the construct of the market you know one of the big stories of 2018-19 was the underperformance of the mid cap index compared to the large caps. Uh, looking back at the last three months data as of January 31st there has been some bit of correction in that uh, over the last three months the uh, nifty uh, mid cap index is up almost about 7 odd percent vis a vis the nifty 50 which is up only about a percent. So there has been little bit of a catch up trade which has happened uh, relative to the vast underperformance of mid caps and small caps. Over one year and three year of course the nifty 50 still remains uh, significantly ahead of where the uh, nifty mid cap index is. Uh, as far as earnings and valuations are concerned uh, the results for the quarter ended December the earnings season is now complete. Uh, we did not see too much change to the financial year estimates for March 20 or March 21 slight downgrades but not as bad as things have been in the past. Uh, it now looks like the market consensus on Bloomberg is for about 12 to 13 percent earnings growth in FY20 and something like about 24 25 percent in FY21. But I think two things we need to keep in mind here the increase in earnings uh, for FY20 primarily being led by the turnaround in the fortunes of some of the financial sector companies particularly banks and also the fact that there was this big tax cut which happened in September which has boosted the earnings of many of the high tax paying companies. So uh, when you sort of exclude the impact of those two which is the turnaround in the bank fortunes and the uh, 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 reduction in tax rate then the earnings growth is quite pedestrian almost negligible largely reflecting the fact that it has been a difficult year for the economy. Uh, next year earnings growth estimated at 24, 25 percent. Nifty EPS expected at about 690 odd rupees for March 21 but again significantly underwritten by normalizing credit cost 
for financial institutions leading to a improvement in the EPS. So, a big chunk of it continues to be led by uh, financials. Uh, what does this mean in terms of valuations? If I look at trailing and forward valuations for the Nifty, it is a mixed picture. It is not particularly cheap, uh, certainly not uh, you know, uh, lower than average um, and at the same time not extremely expensive, particularly if you look at the price to book, it is trading more in fair value territory and I will talk about this later, but essentially what this seems to reflect is a more mixed picture in terms of valuation because there is a lot of dispersion when you look at the valuation numbers and the price to book being lower perhaps also reflects the fact that uh, return on equity for a large part of Indian companies has actually deteriorated uh, over the last few years. Um, when we talk about dispersion, you know, most of the conversation tends to be about the fact that mid caps have significantly underperformed large caps over the last two years. But I think it is very good to remember that over the five year period ended January 2018, mid caps outperformed the large caps by almost 6 to 7 percent per annum, which is a unheard of outperformance compared to the historical average of closer to 250 to 270 basis points. And in a way, the last two years of extreme underperformance has essentially compensated for that strong outperformance of the previous uh, five years. Now, a lot of the valuation dispersion that we are seeing in the market uh, is obviously about growth and value at some level, particularly if you mean, uh, uh, you know, value as uh, uh, meaning a lot of the uh, lower valuations when you look at things like P. Uh, it is also between large caps and mid caps at some level, but again, even within mid caps, if you look at valuations, there is significant difference in valuations and uh, I would only argue that this is not unusual. There has always been dispersion in value but perhaps we are at a point where the dispersion seems slightly higher than what it has been in the past. And just to give you some numbers, uh, if you look at the Nifty, uh, there are currently something like 7 companies out of the 50 Nifty companies which have a PE of higher than 30. Uh, if you look at the Nifty mid cap index out of 100 companies in the benchmark, there are 24 companies which have a PE higher than 30, again suggesting that it is not just a large cap versus mid cap, but even within the large cap universe or within the mid cap universe, there is significant amount of dispersion. Another way to look at this, if you look at companies with a price to book less than 1, uh, the Nifty currently has 9 companies with a price to book less than 1, which is out of 50 companies. Uh, if you look at the Nifty mid cap index, it has got 21 companies with a price to book less than uh, uh, 1 out of the 100 companies in the benchmark and it is in fact got 33 companies out of the 100 which have got a price to book of more than 5. So, this differentiation in the valuation I would submit has always been there. Yes, it has gone up a little bit more based on perhaps where the market is now willing to pay higher valuation for the visibility of growth and corporate governance and it has differentiated I think particularly between companies where there are increasingly issues related to their terminal value and the extent of growth runway that uh, these companies might have. Uh, so, all in all from a valuation perspective, I would say it is a lot more of a mixed picture. Uh, there are opportunities uh, and I think it is you know more relevant today than perhaps ever before to look at the market more on a bottom up basis because we are seeing this dispersion and valuations in some cases justified and in other cases these could be opportunities to play for in terms of mean reversion and I am sure Amit when he talks about the value opportunities fund will actually be able to talk to both of those elements. Um, let me just move on to some few specific questions that uh, we received. One refers to the uh, India China uh, or rather the US China trade war uh, and the impact of that. As I said in my opening comments, unfortunately because of the coronavirus, that issue has moved a little bit off the center stage. Uh, but I do not think this level of trade agreement between US and China is a final agreement. There are far more serious issues related to uh, the embargo on on a capital movement and also on technology transfer which are at the heart of that dispute and I think this US China trade and technology related wars are something which are likely to persist with only you know temporary ceasefires at different points of time. Um, 
where do you think the second question I've got is where do you think the domestic markets are compared to other markets uh, given that growth has been weak. Uh, I think this is a little bit of a challenge particularly on a relative basis. Mind you we have still been receiving significant amount of overseas flow from uh, foreign portfolio investors more than 14, 15 billion last year into equities. So, we are still receiving capital, but yes we have not been among the best performing markets compared to other EMs over the last one year because in an environment where growth has actually softened in India, suddenly people have found other markets where perhaps for similar levels of growth or growth which is not significant lower, they have actually got better opportunities perhaps in terms of valuation and we have seen some of those EMs do slightly better. But I still think India will remain a magnet for a lot of long term capital flows because of the length of growth runway and opportunity in India and this is something that you know we constantly hear when we interact with not just foreign investors, but also a lot of the uh, you know long term investors who are actually making uh, foreign direct investment in India in terms of actually uh, creating uh, businesses. Uh, the next question I have got relates to what is your view on the cyclical sectors in the market and there is a very specific reference to the automobile sector. So, I think there are two things to keep in mind in the automobile sector. One is there is clearly a demand led slowdown which is happening in the sector. Secondly, uh, I think what you also need to keep in mind is there are certain supply side issues because of the technology transition that needs to be carried out in the automobile sector from BS4 to BS6 and therefore, I would submit that in some parts of the auto sector, there is also a challenge that supply is preferring to wait on the sidelines simply because they would rather launch the BS6 product in April rather than roll it out in the market today or they have not yet managed to transfer their entire BS4 portfolio to BS6. Obviously, these arguments for example, do not fully apply in all sectors segments of the market uh, uh, and you know there is still its extent of uh, demand softness in the marketplace. Uh, but I do think the key issue in auto is that the inventory issues are now fully behind us. Most companies are running on very low levels of inventory and therefore, you will start to see the year on year numbers start to improve and once you see a full transition to BS6, things should look better. But again, you know it is only as incomes go that perhaps you will see a little bit more buoyancy come back into the uh, personal vehicle uh, category in particular. Uh, I think the next question we have got is more related to corporate tax rate cut and um, uh, you know does the corporate tax rate cut have an impact on mid caps differently from large caps. Uh, the answer to that is really no. Uh, you know, obviously, the corporate tax cut rate uh, plays into the hands of those companies which were paying much higher rates of tax than the effective 25 percent that they have moved to today. Um, and there are companies both in the large cap space and the mid cap space which benefit from this. Uh, so, I do not think that by itself changes the issue on large and mid cap. Uh, I would also point out as I said in my earlier comments, performance of mid caps has improved over the last three months even relative to large caps um, and while valuations now still remain slightly in favor of mid caps, uh, it is not as attractive as it was maybe in August or September of 2019. So, I think one should not overemphasize the large versus mid cap differential today. Uh, perhaps the bigger timing opportunity was three months ago, but you will always know this in re uh, retrospect. Uh, we would tend to sort of right now tend to look at stocks more on individual merits rather than look through the prism of large versus mid aggressively right now. You know, if we see the opportunity open up again, we will uh, review that, but right now we think you know just evaluate bottom up rather than worry about large cap versus mid cap. Uh, there is another question which is an interesting question and again uh, you know perhaps when uh, Amit talks about the value opportunities he can address some of this, uh, but there is a question about growth investing and value investing uh, and the fact that value funds have not done well and certainly I would argue that our value opportunities fund has actually done quite well over the last one year or even now three years. Um, I think what this really boils down to is an understanding of what is value investing. And if you think about value investing as buying things which are uh, at a price lower than their intrinsic value, where you are paying for expectations embedded in the price which are lower than what that company is capable of achieving, then it has not been a problem managing a value oriented style. I think where the challenge in managing value has been that many people interpret this now purely on a statistical basis. 
which is to say we must buy only the lowest price to book, the lowest price to earnings. And I think a lot of this style of investing is getting some funds into trouble uh, simply because this means you are ending up with a lot of companies which also have end of life cycle related issues or as I said earlier, these could be companies where the terminal value is increasingly coming into question. So in my opinion, value if you think about it only as a statistical factor of cheapness, yes there are some issues, but these are not new issues, these have always been there. Perhaps it is a sign of the disruption which is happening uh, in markets and across many sectors in recent times that it has been accentuated and I do believe there will be some mean reversal in this uh, uh, growth versus value value debate as you start to see growth improve from what is clearly a low base. But we should not fall into the trap of thinking of value as being merely a statistical factor and very cheap valuations. So I think you know I will stop at this point uh, in terms of my overall market outlook and the questions that I have managed to answer and perhaps this opportune moment to hand over to Amit Premchandani who co-manages the value opportunities fund with me and he will give you a quick rundown on that strategy. Thank you very much for participating with us on this call today. Uh, good evening everyone, um, uh, I will talk about the value opportunity fund um, which I co-manage with uh, Vetri Subramaniam. Um, uh, uh, as you know that value opportunity fund um, is classified as a value oriented fund as per the SEBI classification. Uh, we manage the fund uh, with the concept of uh, intrinsic value uh, rather than looking at the traditional uh, method of multiple based uh, valuation approaches. Uh, we manage the fund uh, from a multi-cap perspective. Uh, recently, uh, the fund has undergone a change in the benchmark uh, from BSE 200, uh, the benchmark has moved to Nifty 500. Uh, however, um, our portfolio has not really changed after the change in the benchmark because we were anyways uh, managing the fund uh, from a multi-cap perspective. Uh, in terms of uh, how we perceive value, uh, if you look at uh, sector allocation as well as market cap mix changes, we we'll, uh, consider value to be a, a very important barometer. However, if we uh, uh, move to the stock levels, uh, uh, we follow approach uh, of a barbell strategy. Uh, at one level, um, we buy stocks um, which are uh, seeing cyclical pressures and we expect uh, them to turn around uh, and they have uh, seen multiple corrections. And on the other end, uh, we buy stocks uh, which are very uh, long growth runway. Uh, the expectation of growth uh, is relatively less than what we expect uh, and uh, they have uh, stability in earnings. Uh, in terms of the portfolio mix, almost 40% of the portfolio is uh, uh, having a value tilt and almost uh, the rest 40% is having a straight uh, kind of a growth tilt. Um, when we buy value stocks, uh, two parameters which we consider to be very important are we uh, do not take any balance sheet risk. Uh, we are aware that PNL risk is uh, very much uh, existence or is very much imperative while you uh, buy value, value stocks. But we try to avoid balance sheet risk because balance sheet risk uh, leads to uh, terminal value risk uh, in many of the stocks. Another, uh, an, another filter that we look at while buying value stock is to focus on sectors which have seen uh, across the board correction in valuations because when there are sector level disruptions, many of the good quality companies in that sector also become really cheap and we try to increase allocation to these sectors uh, which have seen across the board correction. Also we focus on sectors where we have seen significant disruption in supply 
although demand has been uh, more or less consistent in that sector. This creates a significant profit pools for the survivor in that sector. In terms of uh, market cap mix, um, we have a 31 percent uh, allocation to small and mid caps at the moment. This allocation has gradually increased over the last uh, one and a half years. Uh, at the bottom of say uh, January 2018, we have a we had a 18 percent small and mid cap allocation. From a strategy point of view, we can uh, move the allocation to 35 to 40 percent range, but at the moment we are uh, having uh, only bottom up approach uh, in terms of market cap mix shifts. Uh, in terms of uh, portfolio composition, uh, almost 52 percent of the portfolio is in what we uh, consider R1 companies, uh, basically companies which have more than 18 percent uh, uh, ROC over the last five year average and the remaining portfolio is in R2 and R3 companies, basically companies where uh, we expect turnaround. Uh, Another unique factor of this portfolio is that uh, we have around 55 stocks in the portfolio and the, all the stocks uh, are having an overweight position. We do not keep any underweight position uh, in the portfolio. We either have an overweight, active weight or we have a zero weight in the portfolio. Uh, hence, if you look at uh, the top 10 benchmark stocks, uh, we have zero weight in uh, five stocks and the overweight in the five st uh, and the remaining five stocks uh, among the top ten benchmark stocks. Uh, in terms of sectoral allocation in the portfolio, uh, we have made significant changes over the last two years. To start off with, uh, auto, which had a very large overweight, uh, say uh, two years back, uh, with a uh, weight of around 15 percent. We gradually have reduced it to as low as 6 percent uh, in the early part of 2019 as we were worried about the uh, volume growth outlook of that sector as well as the technological disruption uh, uh, which, we, which we think will come in the sector. However, due, due, due to the valuation consideration, we actually again increased our uh, allocation to the portfolio uh, to the sectors uh, in the second half of Q2, uh, largely driven by valuation consideration. However, uh, we have uh, more or less exited our passenger vehicle exposure in that segment and we are overweight on the two wheeler side and the commercial vehicle side in that sector. Currently, we have around 8 percent weight uh, uh, to the auto sector which is around 2 and a half percent overweight as compared to the benchmark. Uh, the largest weight in the portfolio is in the banking and financial services segment. Uh, uh, we have a 33 percent uh, allocation to that sector against around 36, 37 percent benchmark weight. Uh, we have been uh, reducing that allocation over the last uh, one or two quarters. Uh, in terms of uh, shift uh, in term, uh, of strategy, we have moved away from uh, too much of retail oriented uh, uh, banks and NBFCs and moved to uh, the theme of uh, corporate credit normalization over the last 18 months. So, the top two overweights of the portfolio has moved from uh, moved towards these names like ICICI Bank and Axis Bank. Uh, earlier, we used to have uh, 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 concentration of uh, NBFC exposure in one or two stocks. Now, we have moved into four to five stocks in the NBFC and non-bank lending segment. Uh, these non-bank lending segments have recently uh, got listed and these are very capital light business uh, generating very high ROE, ROCs. Uh, and in banks, we are largely concentrated in uh, stocks uh, where uh, capital is not a constraint, deposit profile is very strong uh, and return uh, ratios are likely to get normalized uh, very soon. Uh, on, the, on the underweight side, uh, we have a significant underweight uh, on the consumer segment. Uh, that's, this underweight has gradually gone down over the last two quarters, but still we are 3 percent underweight. Uh, we have uh, uh, around 10, 10 and a half percent uh, exposure to this segment. We are largely underweight on the consumer staple side uh, because we think that the intrinsic uh, growth which is implied by the, the implied growth uh, which is uh, implied in the stock price is significantly higher than what they have delivered over the last decade. Uh, we have seen early signs of volume growth uh, significantly tapering off on the staple side, though margins are still holding on. Uh, while we are uh, positive on the uh, small ticket consumer discretionary segment, uh, 
we uh, we think that the margins are continuing to improve in that segment cash flow profile is improving and this uh, the, uh, the penetration story is still to play out uh, in the discretionary side and they have also a lot of option values embedded in them uh, through moving to related uh, segments uh, to which they are already operate, uh, operating in uh, as i said we have been increasing our uh, exposure to this sector uh, uh, and we have added around half to 1% over the last two quarters uh, another seg uh, sector where we are underweight is uh, energy uh, it is a very large underweight uh, however we are overweight on the gas uh, gas part of the energy segment as well as on the utility side we think that the runway of growth uh, for gas companies is very long uh, uh, because transmission volumes are going up and city gas distribution sector is opening up uh, on the utility side valuation are really cheap uh, the stocks that we have uh, kind of invested in do not carry any balance sheet risk they have uh, strong cash flows coming from the uh, operational part of the business while they have already invested in uh, power plants which are not operational and the interest cost of uh, cost of these plants are borne by the uh, distribution side of their business uh, in the last 3 years uh, there have been hardly any new thermal power uh, uh, capacity which has got added and we have these unutilized gas or thermal power plants with these companies uh, and as uh, the demand uh, picks up uh, given no supply in the uh, thermal power segment we expect plfs to go up and the option value of these unutilized uh, plants to get uh, kind of captured uh, in the stock prices in the largest overweight we have pharma uh, where we have around 8% weight uh, a 4% overweight as compared to the benchmark the sector has gone through a significant pain over the last 3 years due to uh, price erosion on the generic segment and uh, plant related issues we have taken care of the risk inherent in the sector by diversifying our exposure into six stocks uh, for a 8% weight on one hand uh, we have exposure to the overseas market through uh, over, uh, through sun pharma and uh, dr reddy and on the other end we have exposure to the domestic market through torrent uh, and sipla and ajanta pharma uh, so we have a very diversified exposure uh, in the pharma space and we are reducing the risk inherent in the sector through this diversification finally on the uh, our theme of uh, supply disruption uh, related sectors uh, uh, the we look out for these kind of sectors we have been adding uh, uh, telecom uh, as well as real estate as part of this theme we expect uh, the survivors uh, uh, in the current disruptive environment uh, in telecom as well as real estate to capture a significant la significantly larger pie of the overall profit pool going forward and we have been adding position in both these sectors overall from a sector allocation point of view for the last one quarter uh, we have been adding uh, consumer and pharma and reducing uh, bfsi and it space uh, finally uh, uh, in terms of uh, active share we have around 65% of the portfolio uh, we have around 65% active share in terms of uh, portfolio turnover we have around 30% uh, portfolio turnover in terms of valuation uh, uh, as i mentioned we don't look at in, uh, the multiple based valuation approach and an intrinsic based valuation approach however from a multiple point of view uh, our price to book of the portfolio is around uh, 4.9 as against a benchmark valuation of 5.9 uh, so this is uh, this is broadly the uh, underlying uh, thought process behind the value opportunity fund uh, i will uh, now move into uh, some of the questions that uh, we have received uh, on this fund uh, the first question is uh, on the pharma sector exposure um, uh, that uh, why we are overweight in that ex uh, in that segment given the concerns uh, in the street and what green shoot that uh, we are uh, we are seeing in that sector so uh, the overweight position is largely driven by uh, a valuation driven approach as I, as we uh, as i mentioned uh, sector level valuation and market cap level valuation uh, market cap level uh, approach is based on valuation consideration the sector price to book and price to sales uh, are at uh, decadal lows uh, also many pharma companies uh, have uh, over the last 3 year, 3 years seen significant erosion in the profitability of non india business so large part of the profit as well as the revenue pool now is coming from india part of the business 
which is still growing at double digit, uh, especially the chronic segment. And if you look at, if you assign a value, if you look at the valuation assigned to the US or overseas business, it is already at uh, commodity level multiples. So the valuation uh, argument have been taken care of by this. Uh, and recently we have seen uh, companies writing off uh, some of their uh, bad investment that they have made in the current, uh, in the previous cycle. What this uh, create is that the capital structure gets normalized for these companies, uh, the return ratio start looking good. They have also started to rationalize the R&D investment, which will drive margins uh, going ahead. However, we have also seen uh, one risk again playing out in that sector, which is the FDA plant related uh, quality issues. We had hoped that uh, the last cycle uh, was the end of this uh, uh, quality related issues, but we have seen of late many companies again reporting uh, uh, FDA non-compliance on some of the quality related issues. However, valuation consideration, valuation uh, are already taking care, uh, taking uh, that into account in most of the names that we own. Uh, the next question is, um, the fund has positive active weights um, at stock levels, uh, which suggest a high uh, conviction level. So, do we, uh, uh, are we going to continue this approach or not in that in this portfolio? Uh, so, if you look at um, the thought process behind having only uh, overweight position in the portfolio, it clearly reflects our uh, approach uh, is la largely led by conviction. We have 55 stocks in the portfolio and all the stocks are having an overweight position and this has been pretty consistent over the last two years that we have been maintaining only overweight positions and not keeping any underweight position or hugging the benchmark at stock levels. Also, uh, active share of the portfolio has uh, uh, for the last two years have not gone down below 50 percent. So, active share has always remained pretty high in this portfolio and it is now as high as 65 uh, percent. As the share of uh, mid cap and small cap increase, active share continues to go up in this portfolio and we have actually increased the small and mid cap share from 18 percent to 31 percent over the last uh, two years. Uh, and uh, the conviction level can also be got from the fact that the top 10 stocks in the portfolio have an aggregate weight of 47 percent against an internal limit of 50 percent. So, we have very strong active weights uh, at the top end of the portfolio. I already mentioned uh, in the top 10 benchmark stocks, we have 5 stocks which with where we have 0 positions and we have 5 stocks where we have a large active weight. It all, all these signify uh, our approach to be uh, to have a very high active weight and a high conviction level uh, driven portfolio. We do not have too many uh, uh, strong overweight position on the sector set side, but we are very strong uh, overweight position or very high active overweight position at the stock level. Uh, in terms of sector levels, uh, we have a very large overweight in the pharma side. Uh, on the pharma side, last year 2018 uh, calendar year 2018 and first half of 2019, we used to have a very strong overweight on the IT set uh, on the IT sector, where we used to carry a 5 percent overweight uh, position uh, in that sector. And uh, before that, in auto, uh, we had a very strong overweight, almost 7 percent overweight in early part of 2018. So we have been uh, uh, rotating sector overweights and maintaining very strong overweights at the stock levels. So, uh, I think that is, uh, these are the two questions that we got on the value opportunity side. Uh, if there are no other questions, uh, I will stop it uh, at that uh, and thanks for listening in. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents.